Just a short drive from the Las Vegas Strip is a warehouse that produces over 5,000 slot machines a year. This $40 million building is the headquarters of Ainsworth Gaming Technology, the fifth largest gaming manufacturer in the country. This company owns several popular slots like Quickspin, Grand Legacy, and Thunder Cash. It takes 200 employees to operate this 300,000 square foot building that is divided in half between office space and the warehouse. We are fortunate to be joined today by Mike Trask, who is the VP of Marketing here at Ainsworth. Mike has over a dozen years of experience working in the slot industry. So we're gonna ask him some questions and get some insight for behind the scenes for how slot machines are produced. So thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for visiting Ainsworth here in Las Vegas. Glad you finally made it to like where slot machines are born. Oh, so okay. uh, happy to show you around and, and hopefully answer some questions. Yeah, so one of the ones that would probably be the most basic one to start off with, you know, from the idea to getting produced. How long would you say that typically takes Ainsworth? Uh, it depends on the game, but generally probably six months to a year from the time our game development team is conceptualizing an idea uh, on a you know piece of paper, right? PowerPoint. Uh, we just did one, you know, they pitched their ideas right. to the point you're seeing it on a casino floor and you're trying to hit a jackpot. Usually probably in that nine months to a year, it can be done a little quicker uh, with some simpler concepts, but generally in that, that range. And when you're going through this process of developing and producing a brand new slot machine, what's the biggest challenge? What are the biggest factors? Well, it's, it's a competitive landscape for sure, right? Uh, you're talking about multiple vendors in the industry doing this, you know, out here on the 215, if you, you drive down, you see us, you see some of our competitors all right from the highway. And so you're talking about, you know, a, a very competitive landscape. So that's first. And then secondly is right. I mean, there has been a lot of slot machines made over years. Yeah. And so trying to come up with that right idea, getting the math right, getting the art right, uh, making sure it's, it's compliant with all applicable you know, regulations. Um, so there's a number of little challenges from a creative side to an engineering side to, to in some cases, even a, a legal regulatory side. As it pertains though to regulatory agencies, so the Nevada sure. Gaming Control Board and you know, across other states and other countries have their own agencies. You know, what is that dynamic like between you creating a slot machine, the casino and the gaming control board saying you have to pay out this certain rate? I mean, you know, who set those actual rates? What yeah, so 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 everybody who comes to Vegas probably heard of the, you know, the Nevada Gaming Commission, right. uh, but there's similar commissions in, in every gaming market in, in the US abroad. Uh, and so, you know, we are, upheld to meeting the standards and requirements of each of those those markets uh it is close to a hundred different markets just in the u.s i think it's 60 something right now plus you know europe plus australia uh everywhere else so certainly you know they are making sure that the player is coming in and are is getting a fair experience on their their game watching out for responsible gaming issues it's vital to the industry that that's there. Um, and you know, we meet those, we take it very seriously. It's a large part of what we do. Everybody here carries, you know, some kind of license with a number of agencies. And you know, so that dynamic is a game's made, we talked about. It is submitted and, and goes through a process to make sure it's approved uh, before we can potentially put it on a casino floor. Is there ever, ever really any kind of difference of opinion or struggle between the payout rate that maybe the, you know, governing yeah. body wants set or the manufacturer wants or the casino wants. Uh, I wouldn't say payout percentage really comes into play, right? Is is all markets have a minimum payback percentage, you know, typically around 85% is, is about standard across. It can fluctuate uh, depending on the market. And, and, you know, to make a game that's paying less than that, I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a pretty negative experience for the player, right? So, you know, from a slot machine manufacturer perspective is a lot of, we believe, you know, higher payout is going to give a better play experience and then the player is going to play more. Um, but at the end of the day, those uh, returns to player paybacks percentages, this stuff you're seeing in the industry newsletters is, is really at the end of the day going to be determined by the casino or the, the tavern or whatever location you're choosing to gamble in. Really? So basically the governing body will say, here's the minimum. You here's the minimum. We'll make a game that has multiple percentages that it can pay back. So if you walk by a game 
you know, there is the 90% version, there might be a 92% version, there might be an 88% version, all of the same fundamental game, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that payback percentage can be slightly different from casino to casino or market to market. But the casino ultimately choose which slot machine The casino they want. ultimately chooses what games they want. You know, we're competing for their business. There are partners on that end. The regulatory committees are overseeing both and you know, uh, and we're trying to offer all of those returns to players that our casino partners want. So it's really a balance between the agency saying this is the minimum payout. Correct. The, the manufacturer saying, okay, we have these machines at these different payouts and the casino saying we want to choose from you know, the options you have. Exactly it, right? So it's three pronged. There's, there's the legal level, there's the casino level, and then there's, you know, we're making a variety of variations within those levels. One big question that people have about slot machines is once they leave this warehouse, they make it onto the casino floor and there is that payback percentage. Can that percentage be changed over time once it's on the casino floor or is it set at the percentage the casino bought the machine at? So when, it, when a casino buys a game, think of it as like buying uh, the new Call of Duty software. And then it goes in your computer or your PlayStation or whatever. It's a similar tool in, in our business, right? You're buying a software of the game. So in theory, certainly you could change the game, uh, the game's return to player, as we call it. Um, but over time, that number is infinite, right? So if it's paying back 90% uh, of, of play, you know, in, in, in a set long time period, it's going to land at 90%. It's going to have good days. It's going to have bad days. It's going to have a lot of in-between days. Right. Um, and there's going to be the day that somebody hits the big jackpot and like that machine did not, it paid back, you know, a thousand percent or whatever the case may be that day. But return to player is, is a tool. Those percentages are based on an infinite time scale of what a game is capable of doing. And that math works out in the long run. It's not as if it's changing from moment to moment. So hopefully that uh, makes sense, right? A uh, similar thing would be uh, a roulette wheel is the example I always use. Like okay. every whatever it is, 38 or 39 times, it's going to land on one, right? But that doesn't mean on the 38th time it's going to land on one. Correct. That means that over you know, years and months and thousands of times goes on, you're going to look at that math and you're going to be like, ah, that landed on one pretty close to the exact percent of time. Slot machine, fundamentally, the math works the same way as that. Another question people often have, because they hear different things about slots, is strategy. So you've, I mean, you've been on the side of making these games. Yeah. So people say, hey, what's a strategy to winning a slots? Are there any True strategies that you would say uh, are legitimate. The strategy I've tried to rely on is just hope I'm really lucky that day. <laughs> is uh, is really my best strategy uh, gimmick. I mean, these games are totally random, and when you hit that spin button, you're getting one of millions of potential results uh, on the game. So you have to be very, very lucky, mm -hmm. um, particularly, you know, to, to, to hit these massive jackpots. But look, it does happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you see that return to player and all this type of stuff and you see the progressive jackpots, you know, what I mean, they, they hit, they have to. It's part of regulation is you can't show an award that you're not going to give right. away. Um, and so, but as far as strategy, look, um, there is blogs and websites and YouTubers out there, uh, you know, with all kinds of different strategies. Uh, I can just say that you need to be very lucky um, and uh, you need to uh, stick within your bankroll, play responsibly. And uh, when you do win, it's a blast. Um, but we hope as the manufacturer that, you know, even if it wasn't the day you walked out with the jackpot, that we've given a, a cool play experience, right? That, that people want to come back and enjoy again. And, and that chase and that, oh, like I was that, so close, right? And so, that dopamine hit. you know, that's um, the fun of gambling, right? Is that, that what if and that chase. And, and of course, when you win, it's, it's extra awesome. And, and we've all had wins and losses, right? So there's no, so there's no secret. There's no course you can buy to win. Uh, there's no 
insider uh, I, no consultations or someone's got a uh, you know, that no one else has I heard don't, of. I've heard all kinds of strategies over my time in the business from, you know, you got to touch this spot on the screen <laughs> to, to what game to uh -huh. look for, right? And, um, you know, they are, again, it's, in a, it's a random number, uh, you know, that, that is drawn that, that drives all this. And it's millions of potential outcomes and uh, you know that's the fun, right? Is that it is it is the uh, the 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 gambling aspect, yeah. the chance, the, the chance. dollar, and the dream. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, it, it's super fun. I think everybody who works here, you know, uh, at least most people who work here, myself. You know, we we play right. like we get it. That's part of the thing. And um, believe me, I've had days I've come home like I figured this all out, right? You know what I mean? Like I don't even know. And then there's days where you're like, ah, I definitely did not figure it out, and I better uh, go to work, you know. So get lucky. That's your strategy tip. Okay. When it comes to all these slot machines being built and going onto the casino floor, one idea I've heard, and this might be more hearsay, so I'm going to ask you is that machines that are branded after like a movie or a TV show or something like that, those machines supposedly cost more to produce and because they do, they supposedly have a lower payback percentage. Is there truth to that? Uh, so we've done a number of branded games. Uh, most popular one we've ever done was a Pac-Man game, uh, which was very cool. Uh, are they more expensive to produce? It depends on the license, right? But yes, there's a third party. Uh, you know, whether uh, it's a singer or a movie, it's, it's not free to take that. Um, but typically how that's paid for by the manufacturer is by some form of lease agreement with the operator. So as opposed to it being sold outright, there may be some agreement with the operator where it costs more. Thus, those games, you have to make them perform better. You need players to love those games for it to be successful. But as far as the actual payback on the game, you know, that's going to be in line uh, with with everything else on a floor, right? And so if uh, if you have our Pac-Man game uh, next to one of our quick spin games on a floor, you know those are very likely going to be the the same or close to the same type of RTP that's set by that casino. So really, they don't really get any special treatment from uh, other machines. They they get special treatment in the terms of the marketing and the branding, um, and are held to a much higher expectation by properties, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it it's valuable floor space. Um, but as far as those percentages, you're still offering the same sort of a menu of paybacks, if you will. No matter if it's a, a classic penny game or the the Pac-Man penny game. Okay. Who is an agency? Like you said, there's several, but what is an agency that audits these machines that does you know, sure. thousands and thousands of spins to make sure that they're so there's properly? there's two major sort of third party testing labs. Uh, so they will test these games and they are contracted by markets around the globe. Uh, both of them have offices here in Las Vegas um, as, as well as elsewhere. Um, so they are testing auditing games on their level. And then a place like Nevada also tests all the games by the state agency themselves so they'll they'll go through multiple testing in in many markets if not most markets uh, to ensure uh, you know safety security fairness uh, meeting regulatory requirements in terms of how wins are portrayed and, and uh, that all the the jackpots shown are available and we're talking about uh, one test we run on our games is a hundred million simulated spins so it is, uh, you know, a significant amount of effort that goes into ensuring that those games meet the requirements. And let's say the state of Nevada realized one of your games is, you know, it's not in compliance. What will they do? They'll come back uh, they would revoke the game, right? So if there's ever a, a problem or something that was missed, uh, the, uh, Nevada or other regulatory agencies uh, can essentially send notice to the property that that game has to be shut down um, and you know we have to either fix it or, or go put a different game in or take the game away. Is it just that one single machine or is it that game so at the casino they would have to shut them down? It depends on on the market but if it was for instance like a uh, an issue with something was discovered that a wheel wedge or a, a line win is not paying correctly like so uh, I got five of a kind and uh, there was an error in payment that would be all of that game uh, everywhere. Oh, wow. So 
Mike, where are we at? Uh, Jacob, we're, we're in the Ainsworth office. Unique office. Yeah, so this is where our game development team is, hence the slot machines, uh, some crazy decorations. And, and so the people uh, who work in this area of the building are everything from mathematicians, graphic artists, software engineers, uh, game builders, uh, you know, other technical type quality assurance type people. Um, and so they are the folks who generally are concepting yeah. these games and, and uh, in doing the work, whether it's you know drawing the cute panda you've seen or uh, coming up with the math model but beyond you know how often a bonus hits or uh, or you know programming the game to make sure that you know when you hit the two dollar spin button it's betting two dollars at the appropriate level um, and a huge part of what we do here this location for Ainsworth is uh, one of several we have. So we have another game development studio in Sydney, Australia, where our corporate headquarters is. Um, and we just opened one in Austin, Texas as well. Um, and then of course here, uh, we have uh, our team building the next generation of games. So when they have like a new game idea, they start, like at what point, obviously it has to start here with the idea. It has to start with trying to make it functional. Yeah. How long does that generally take on a, on a game before they say, okay, Let's start building this in the warehouse. Uh, so, so is, is what we'll do is, is typically games will start with a big pitch meeting. So we'll do this uh, a few times a year where the game developers or frankly anybody in the company who thinks they have a great game idea, okay. right? Uh, and they will come and they will present their game idea. Um, some of them fully formed, elaborate storyboards. Some of them like kind of, uh, well, what if, yeah. uh, you know, you did X, Y, Z. And so at that point, you know, out of, you know, however many games, we'll, we'll pick a couple and a, uh, sort of whether it's our, our heads of the game studios, uh, people uh, across our organization, including myself, who, you know, say, all right, you know, kind of, uh, you know, green light that one for lack of a better term. And, uh, you know, from there, you know, they're starting the, the process of drawing everything you see on a game, right? Yeah. Um, some of the stuff standard, right? Like, you know, your, maybe your, your royal real, your royal symbols don't change a ton from game to game, but all of those symbols and all of the art you're seeing on top and whatever's on the top screen and animators doing the work there. Uh, at the same time, you have you know a math team looking back and you know building those real strips and, and doing the math model to ensure all these variations are available. And then you have you know, programmers stitching this all together into a fully functioning uh, thing. So from the time that happens to usually seeing it on a cabinet, uh, you know at least probably you know a couple months. Um, there's a variety of, you know, just one game. Yeah. And a variety of stops along the way of, you know, art reviews and math reviews and, and quality testing. And of course, you know, then, then through the compliance process, so like we've talked about, you know, it's, it's a, a significant amount of effort, time, uh, frankly, financial resources spent into, uh, taking a game from that, you know, PowerPoint deck to like, you know, to, to, to guys making YouTube videos of it at uh, yeah. the local casino is a, a long journey for it. So it's pretty common for you to have multiple games being worked on. Oh, at any given time, there's, uh, you know, dozens of games in various terms of, uh, various states of production, right? From multiple studios, right? So uh, this is one studio. Uh, like I said, there, we have three of them now. Um, in addition to, to the potential use of, you know, third parties doing this. So uh, at any given time, you know, if we're doing, uh, you know, 40 to 60 titles a year, they're all over in production from being tested regulatorily to, you know, just in, uh, just in somebody's mind and every step in between. If in a given year you have 40 to 60 titles that you will work on, if you had to give an estimated percentage of how many actually make it onto the casino floor, what would you say? So of those 40 to 60 titles that we're working on, uh, certainly the goal is for all of them to make it onto a casino floor. But 
part of that is that's only the first barrier, right? So, uh, you know, there's games that, that make it onto a casino floor and the players, your viewers decide, you know, we don't like that one and the machine can, can kind of uh, go disappear. Um, but, you know, you're hoping of that. You get a handful of those games that, that really stick and really resonate with the players. And, and you come up with that thing like, you know, our, our Eagle Box game or our thing like our Supercharged 7, our Quick Spin game, right? That, you know, you walk into just about any casino um, uh, around Las Vegas or, or anywhere else, and you're going to see those games, right? And they become kind of integral to that casino experience. And one thing about when it comes to the placement of machines on casino floors is that, from what I understand, the casinos actually have to rely quite a bit on the manufacturers to help guide them with where they think machines should be placed or how many machines because yeah the people might think of manufacturers say okay we want as many of our machines on your floor as possible but there might be an area where the casino would say okay we can put four of your machines here but you might say no four is going to be too many let's actually put two instead of four because it's like you oversaturate that section of the floor yeah i mean look uh you know the casino floors the casinos is constant negotiation with the manufacturers competition for those key you know those key spots those places people walk in or or uh you know the next to the the whatever the coffee shop or whatever those kind of top key locations on our casino floor are are competitive amongst the manufacturers with the casino and then uh certainly uh, we're looking at games and in what configuration or package we think uh, is going to work the best, whether that's you know a four pack or a six pack, or a, you know, and that's going to vary greatly depending on you know what what style of game it is. If it's a link, if it's a high denom game, but absolutely that is ongoing. In in what I think folks who maybe live in Las Vegas see from like a local casino that you, if you just visit a casino once a year, as you sort of forget, like the casino floor constantly changes. Right. Casino floor is a living, breathing, like it's, <laughs> it's right. Like, and so, you know, uh, occasionally it's like, I used to have my game right there. Like, where did it go? And, and those games are constantly changing. And then COVID changed a lot of that as well. Right. So just within that, though, you know, the casinos, they don't charge you any more to have machines in certain locations on the floor. They, no. So that's something that's another concept. Yeah. So 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 business model of a manufacturer is is really twofold. Right. And so and it's basically, you know, you're selling the product to the casino. Um, and of course, you are pushing to have a a a primary location uh, or, or a good location because, you know, we want the game to perform well, right? Like, yeah, it's, um, so does the casino. It's, so does the casino, money. correct. Both make money. But the, there's a different price point. I've never heard of that. Like, oh, that's the cheap section. Right. Uh, I haven't found that to be true. So it's no. not more to be near the high limit room versus uh, the d- I don't think so, unless it's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. If it's news to you. You've been in for a dozen. I years, don't know. So. Yeah, but no, it's you know, like I said, that's that's the primary business model, um, and that's sort of irrelevant of where it is. Now, there are certainly areas of a casino floor where you know historically games perform better, um, and so you also hear um, in the industry about two things, like a floor average, like the average amount of win or or coin in our spend if you will to simplify it on a casino floor and then you also hear about like a zone average which is like you know uh here is the the hotter zones on a floor um and so from a performance standpoint you you're definitely looking at that right you're seeing how you did against the competition in a like environment so this kind of plays in the idea where people think that machines that are at the end of the aisle or machines that are near an entrance door have better payback rates yeah, and, because they're by like the heavy foot traffic. And they probably do get one on more because they're played more, right? It's a chicken or the egg, right? So if like that's the most popular game on a casino floor, like, yes, people win on it more than the game that is rarely played. And so it becomes that uh, the the fun of gambling, right? Like every time I walk by, somebody's winning. But every time you walk by, somebody's on the game too. And there's there's other games you've walked by a dozen times and- You never notice people. Correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating world, right? And, and, and the way players um, have learned to navigate that all um, is incredible, right? And this, and, you know, this YouTube yeah. world, right, of, of them knowing so much about the games and so much information about how every game works. Uh, it, it's interesting, and it's, it's honestly it's a tool we use for development. People think of gambling, whether it's slots or anything, or a casino, they think of all the money that gets spent and all the money that casinos win over time, right? The house always wins. Yeah. But you know, as a slot manufacturer, you know, if you had to give an idea, like what does it cost a manufacturer to just make a machine? Uh, it's, it's significant, right? In the manpower cost, the regulatory cost, the technology cost. Uh, without getting into to specific details, look, I mean, Ainsworth is a publicly traded uh, corporation, right, on, on the Australia Stock Exchange, uh, did, you know, the U.S. was well over $100 million in revenue last year um, and, you know, continues to, to flourish. Um, so you can imagine these costs are significant into the R&D um, and, and it's important, a, a huge investment we're making currently in R&D. We opened a studio in Austin, Texas, for instance. We, we've hired some, some new talent that we were just in their office um, because again, it's a competitive market out there. Um, you know, there's a number of manufacturers. We can see some of them from the balcony, right? And, uh, and so we, we invest heavily in it. And, uh, you know, there's significant funds spent in developing those games in, in the millions of dollars. Because they just, because a person might play a slot, they just see one slot machine. You see a simple game. And they're just pressing um, a butt. It seems and, so simple. And uh, it, it is simple. I think the best games are a simple experience, right? right? Um, but you know, man, you're talking the graphics and the engineering and the hardware, right? right? Just the cabinet uh, manufacturing and is significant. It's in the millions of dollars is spent on R and D um, for for you know a, a big company, and our, our competitors are equally uh, and in many cases much bigger in terms of, of that. These are these are big companies and great places to work. Great places to. Uh, to uh, have in the neighborhood, I, I hope we're good neighbors, and um, and uh, you know a, a pretty uh, interesting part of the Las Vegas community that probably gets overlooked a lot. It, it does, it does, and it's also which is interesting to see the behind the scenes though, because someone like I said may see that one slot machine, but they don't realize yeah. all the money that went into making that, or all the other slot machine ideas that were you know yeah. went through the production process but never made it to the casino floor it's, and all those costs you had to take in there's effect. a million games <laughs> there there's a million ideas yeah. that, that didn't make it as there isn't of you there's been a million videos that you've been like that didn't yeah. work you know <laughs> to say, uh, the least. say right and and everything's a learning process and a significant r d um, but as part of that and part of that race is, is building the right culture and hiring the right people and uh, having a big cool office and all these yeah. things that go in um, to really investments at the end of the day, creating this, this game. Yeah. So Mike, thank you for uh, coming on today. And well, one, having us here, but two, also answering all these questions. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming by Ainsworth. Uh, I think you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> I appreciate it. To get to see all this behind the scenes stuff and share this with the public is something that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I think people, uh, whether they're visiting Vegas or, or even the people who live here, right? You're like, what are these big buildings? And yeah. what what is that big red A on the yeah. side do? Um, and you know, look, we're, we're very proud of what we do here, you know, from from the manufacturing side to the game development to all the other people, you know, whether it's the, the finance and accounting people, the regulatory people, the, the marketing folks, right. um, you know, it's a fully functioning thing and, and we're very proud of it and, and you know, um, always happy to show it off. No, exactly. Yeah, people probably most people probably don't drive drive by and they don't realize this place makes five thousand slot machines. I no clue, right? No clue. It's the big the big red A, right? Is, yeah. is what people say. But uh, you know, um, you got a little look at it, and it's uh, you know a pretty dynamic employee base, uh, pretty you know interesting, unique environment, and. Uh, you know, we are constantly recruiting for more people and, and in this market, you know, trying to compete to, to get those employees and, and again, make that next great game. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I appreciate you.